We are excited to be joined by Jenny Lindy Clerk, who joins us to talk about five very important Puritan women who the Lord has used in an encouraging way. Welcome and thanks for joining us, Jenny Lynn. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. Please feel free to take a moment to introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. So I am an editor at Crossway, a job that I love. And uh, previously I worked at Regent College as a Puritan project assistant, uh, working with their rare books there in the library. And while I was there, I was doing my PhD as well. Um, so I have a handful of degrees in historical theology, all specializing in Puritan spirituality. And now I've written my first book. <laughs> Oh, wow. That sounds like a very cool job for many people listening. Um, tell, tell us about some of those rare books. What sort of books did you have in your library? Oh, boy. All sorts of things. Um, it all started with donations from J.I. Packer and Jim Houston. Um, so, I mean, a whole range of stuff, uh, really early Puritan works and even just special things from their like personal lives, basically, that they wanted to give that weren't necessarily related to the Puritans, but like, you know, the first copy that Dr. Packer got from his parents of Calvin's Institutes, like just really amazing sure. things. So all sorts of stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, oh, wonderful. Sounds really good. In case we have anyone watching or listening who are unfamiliar with the term Puritan, briefly explain who the Puritans were for us, Jenny. Yeah, so the Puritans were basically a group of ministers and lay people in 17th century England who felt like the Reformation hadn't quite gone far enough or it wasn't finished yet. Um, and so they sort of saw what they thought were vestiges of Roman Catholicism, things like wearing vestments and using prayer books that they just felt like, you know, weren't necessary or weren't biblical. Um, and so, yeah, they wanted to take things a little bit further. And one of two of the things that they're sort of mostly remembered for uh, are their emphases on living a godly life, hence the term Puritan, <laughs> and also uh, having like closer intimate communion with God. Yeah. What was your first contact with a piece of Puritan writing? Yeah, it was at, I can't remember if it was the end of my undergrad or the beginning of seminary, but um, I was chatting with my husband one day and I said, oh, I'm looking for a book about sin and the Christian life, but like something that's really practical and useful. And so far, you know, the things that I had been seeing uh, in school just weren't really like answering the questions that I was asking as a Christian about my own life. Um, and so my husband said to me, I think the book on sin is like something about mortification of sin by John Owen. <laughs> so I got that book and yeah, the rest is history. I just found it amazing. So helpful. It like went above and beyond my expectations. And from then on, I was like, I'm only studying the Puritans. <laughs> <laughs> for sure when when we talk about puritans often most people are going to be thinking about men right so what inspired right. you to write specifically about puritan women and their work yeah so uh basically it all started when i was working at regent my supervisor dr cindy alders who had specialized in um women and children's sort of spiritual spirituality and spiritual writings from the 18th century came into my office one day and said you should do like curate some display on Puritan women. And in the moment I was like, oh, great idea. Sounds good. I'll get on that right away. And the minute she left my office, I thought, oh no, I've never even thought about this. I'm so embarrassed. I have no idea who the Puritan women are. Are there any, what are their names? Like, and so I immediately got to work and yeah, I mean, not it's not totally surprising because I was already loving the male Puritans, but I just really fell in love with everything that I was reading from the women. Um, and yeah, even sometimes, you know, connected to it on a bit of a different level, being a woman and a writer myself. And uh, so then I started kind of just adding little tidbits about them to my writings on the Puritans at the time, lectures that I was giving in like schools and churches and stuff like that about the Puritans. And everyone just had such a great reaction. I always had people coming up to me saying, oh, I really love that about, you know, so-and-so, this one Puritan woman, what should I read about her? Like, how can I learn more about her or the other women? And I kind of struggled to suggest further readings for them because most of the time they were looking for something that was like a little bit more accessible and devotional not so much like the super hard hitting academic academic stuff that just like has a bunch of technical language and you know doesn't necessarily 
make it like relatable to their life or whatever. Um, and so the longer that went on, the longer I started to think, hmm, I think this is a hole in the market and maybe I should fill it. <laughs> So briefly give us the names of each of the five women in your book and how did you come to choose them? Yeah, so there is Agnes Beaumont, Lucy Hutchinson, Mary Rich, Anne Bradstreet and Lady Brilliana Harley. Um, they weren't that hard to choose because the sort of pool that I was choosing from to begin with was, you know, a lot smaller than compared to something like if you're just going all Puritan men or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so not a ton to work with right off the bat. But then I sort of narrowed it down to those five um, because I wanted to pick women who did two things. First of all, wrote their own stuff as nice as it is to sort of read about women from men's perspectives and, you know, the stories they were telling about them. Maybe the women didn't have an opportunity to write themselves or they didn't want to or whatever. That's all good. But I felt like it would be even better if I, you know, focused on the things that they said, uh, the way they talked about things personally. And then the second thing I was looking for is who was writing on Christian spirituality, sort of like practical Christian living stuff that I think most people can connect with and really love rather than like 17th century politics or something like that. Yeah. So you mentioned that you, you, you didn't have a massive list to begin with and you boiled it down to five. Who else was on the shortlist? Who, who didn't quite make the cut? What other names were there? Um, there was a couple um for someone like for example Catherine Phillips who was a 17th century writer and did a lot about like friendship really beautiful things wrote poetry but there's not a ton of we don't know like a hundred percent sure was she a Puritan was she not even religious at all like there weren't a lot of themes in her writing so that wasn't like coming through very clearly and then there were some others like uh Dorothy Lee uh, who basically wrote like sort of like an advice book uh, to her son. But I ended up feeling like it was a little bit too close to a couple of the other women that I had already thrown in there. Um, and yeah, we sort of once I picked the five women, I also realized that that was enough to give uh sort of different examples of like they all come from different denominations uh they all are using sort of different genres of writing like letters or theology books or diary entries or whatever um and they also had different political views and sort of different like social standing so i felt like that was sort of enough diversity <laughs> to you know <laughs> give a general picture of you know what life was like in the 17th century and who these puritan women were yeah yeah well i'm really excited to find out a lot more about these five women so take yeah. a couple of minutes per story and briefly walk us through each life Sure. Yeah. So um, Agnes Beaumont was a basically a young convert and um, she started going to John Bunyan's church at, at one of the churches he was preaching at at the time. And her father was really not happy about this for various reasons, including like hearing rumors about Bunyan being sort of this sketchy person. Um, and that kind of led to a series of like crazy crises in her life. Um, and then at the end of it all, she wrote down this narrative of everything that happens, uh, that happened at that period of time for her. Um, so it's a really interesting document, partly because uh, she was sort of on a lower social status, which is a little bit less common than sort of like the wealthier women who might have more time or opportunities or interest in reading and writing. Um, but I also really love it because I feel like there's a lot in the narrative about what it's like to relate to God, like her personal experiences of being in a relationship with God. So that was something I loved about that. And I thought she's definitely got to get in there. And she's, yeah, yeah. you know, sort of represents the Baptists <laughs> at the time. Um, and then there's Lucy Hutchinson. Uh, she was a historian and a poet and a theologian. Um, she, her sort of three main books were, she did like a little history of the civil war happenings of the civil war in her local area. She also did an epic poem of Genesis. And she also wrote, uh, what is the only, what we think is the only systematic theology that we have from a woman in the 17th century. So she is a super interesting person because she's really sort of, she's kind of like a scholar in her own right, even though women couldn't go to university and stuff like that she really 
pushed the envelope as far as she could and uh, did these amazing things and was a real sort of brainiac. Um, and then there is Mary Rich. Uh, she uh, was a countess. So her husband came to unexpectedly inherit his father's estate and they basically became rich overnight. And she spent most of her life uh, being involved in sort of like philanthropy. She ended up giving away almost a third of her income to do all sorts of things, supporting like schools and students in the area, helping suffering pastors at the time because of religious persecution, and um, also, you know, helping the poor out in physical ways like medicine and shelter and things like that. Um, and the writings that we sort of get into uh, in my book are her meditations um, and Basically, her book of meditations is the only published book of meditations by a woman at that time in the 17th century. So again, something really unique and interesting. Uh, what I really love about her story is uh, when you start to get to know her, you see that she went through a lot of like really horrible things in her personal life, but she ended up sort of becoming this like powerhouse in terms of caring for and providing for people in her community. So she kind of turned it, all these bad things into something really beautiful. Um, and then there's Anne Bradstreet, which probably more people have heard of, especially in the state. I'm a Canadian, uh, so I didn't know about Anne Bradstreet until um, I was first, you know, introduced to all these Puritan women a few years ago to begin with. Um, but I'm I'm told that, you know, students in the state learned about Ad Bradstreet really early on. And so people might already know that she was the first person, male or female, uh, to publish a book of poetry in America. And so, yeah, we learn a little bit about her life, sort of her experience immigrating to New England with her husband and her parents. And then a lot of the different things she went through as she kind of, you know, set up a house and started having kids and started writing her poetry. Um, yes, really, really interesting thing. Something that I especially love about her is that you sort of get a different, sometimes poetry can express things in different ways than prose can. So you get sort of a different feel from her and different ideas coming through. And then the last one is Lady Brilliana Harley, and she is remembered for her letter writing, basically. Uh, when the Civil War started happening in England, um, her husband and her older children were away from the house because it was kind of a chaotic time and all sorts of crazy things are happening. Uh, and basically the Royalists, the Royalist army started attacking her house, which was a literal castle. And she had to protect not only like herself and her younger kids, but also her employees and even other Puritans in the area who had basically like sought shelter with her. Um, and she did this through letter writing. She wrote letters back and forth with the Royalist commander and even with the king. So some really crazy stuff. We don't go too far into that. Uh, because again, it gets into a lot of politics, <laughs> which I feel like would lose people pretty quickly. But um, she also exchanged like almost, I can't remember if it's a little bit under 400 or a little bit over 400 letters with her eldest son, Edward, when he first went off to college and then also during the Civil War. And so it's a really interesting look like into this super private relationship and all the things that they would talk about, like spiritual stuff but also just regular life stuff um and yeah it's a fun little look into this sort of private relationship at the time that was really beautiful and interesting so yeah that's all of them <laughs> you do a really good job of taking a chapter per life and then you bring them all together at the end don't you which is really good um, yeah. have you put them in order of your preference is your is your favorite with chapter one <laughs> No, I, Lucy Hutchinson is kind of my favorite, but I have to say when I was like doing the crazy deep dive research into each of these women, it, I would always feel like whoever I was studying at the time was my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> They're so yeah. interesting in different ways, but yeah. no, I actually organized it. I don't know if this was a good method or not, but I tried to organize it, like start off with Beaumont because 
her stuff is really easy to read. It's just like a story about her life. And then I thought, okay, let's come in with Hutchinson because it's a bit harder. <laughs> Maybe we've had a bit of a warm up here and then go back to Mary Rich, have a bit of a break because she's easy to read and then get into Brad Street, who isn't that hard, but I know some people struggle with poetry and then end with Harley, who again is kind of easy. So I tried to mix it up in case I didn't want somebody to open the first chapter and think, oh, poetry and hardcore theology. This is not what I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine it wasn't particularly easy. How did you find information about these overlooked women in Christian history? Yeah, um, I sort of followed the, you know, same routine that I've always done researching everything and that you're sort of taught in university. Start with, you know, dictionaries and encyclopedias to try to get a bit of a lay of the land, like who is who and what is what and what is available to even research. Um, and then once I sort of got some basic information, I tried to read all the primary sources first. Uh, I kind of like doing that just because I almost don't want to know what other people think. I just want to sort of have my own personal time with it um, and my own personal reactions. And that's all, you know, the primary sources are obviously the most important thing too. So really bite a chunk off of that and then basically read all of the secondary sources that exist, which uh, for some was more than I thought, like Brad Street, just because she's popular in like, you know, literature circles and stuff like that. Some of it, other figures, you know, there's not so much to read about them. Um, but yeah, that was my basic method. And um, it wasn't that hard, mostly because I wasn't trying to do like groundbreaking historical research, which if you're doing that, and you're like at an advanced level, you kind of are in the mindset of like, I'm gonna have to fly to wherever this place is that I think might have some documents, read manuscripts that maybe haven't been published or haven't had anything written about them. Um, so yeah, because I wasn't really doing that, I was able to just benefit from the already published sort of like critical editions of the primary sources and, you know, all the other things that have been written about them. Um, so yeah, it, it was okay, but I do hope at some point to to do like a Puritan woman trip. I have convinced my husband to one day go with me uh, like to all the places they lived, which is a bit of a thing because you got, they're not like right beside each other as right, you, know, yeah. you know, you probably yeah. know these places I'm talking about. So thankfully I've convinced him because he grew up in South Africa. So he knows how to drive on the other side of the road. <laughs> Well, it sounds like your plan's already coming together. Uh, <laughs> very, very good. In many ways, these are five very individual women, but what are some of the um, common shared traits that you recognize when you look at them? Yeah, I think one of the super obvious ones is that they were all Puritan. So you can expect lots of talk about godliness and the Bible and being in a relationship with God. That is a very clear theme in yeah. all of their writings that just rises to the surface immediately when you start to read them. Um, I think another sort of common trait or theme that I saw that surprised me a little bit was sort of their, I don't know what to call it, their like courage and savvy and, and strength. Um, not because I necessarily, like at this point, I had already known a lot about the Puritans before I started reading the women. So I didn't really buy into all of the Puritan stereotypes uh, that sort of misunderstand who they really were as a group. But I was surprised to see how these stereotypes were like so completely off base. And these women were, you know, really strong and interesting personalities. They weren't at all what you might expect if all you've been told about the Puritans is like, they were really harsh and scary and mean and like oppressed people, including probably, you know, all the women and children around them. So that was a really cool thing to see in all of them. You know, they definitely have distinct personalities, which you'll see if you read the book. But at the same time, I think they do all, all of them have sort of this like uh, foundational strength in them of like, I know who God is. I love him and I'm going to do my thing now, <laughs> even if, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever hardships are coming my way. And then the, the only other thing I can really think of off the top of my head is um, 
that they were, none of them were like super deaf some of them did like I mentioned earlier Beaumont was sort of on a lower social status and even Hutchinson uh after her husband died things went really downhill for her in terms of like finances and stability uh so they weren't all super rich or rich all the time or whatever but there there is sort of a baseline of like most of the writings we have from history are from people who obviously know how to read and write and then have some kind of opportunity or desire to read and write. Yeah. Yeah. How likely is it that they would have interacted or even met each other during their lives? Uh, You know what? I did look into that because I was curious because sometimes they're like close enough in proximity and, you know, their birth and death dates are close enough that they might have interacted. I didn't find any like, real proof that that happened which doesn't totally surprise me like they don't have cars so they're not just like driving around <laughs> England meeting everyone all the time but um and there's no zoom I... sorry go ahead there's no zoom either no zoom yeah <laughs> no cars no zoom none of that no phones um yeah. but I did come across one source that said that Anne Bradstreet's husband worked for Mary Rich's, um, I'm now going to mess this up, Mary Rich's mother-in-law. It was either mother-in-law or grandmother-in-law. So her husband's mom or grandma. And that there may have, it, it wasn't an actual commentary on maybe Anne Bradstreet and Mary Rich met, but it did tell me based on the dates that they could have maybe come across each other yeah. and maybe Mary Rich had come across uh, and Bradstreet's husband at, at the bare minimum. So maybe <laughs> wow. okay. very possible, yeah. but yeah, we do also know of interactions. I mean, it's obvious from Beaumont's story with Bunyan that there were, you know, famous Puritan men who we know about like John Bunyan and John Owen and Richard Baxter that knew these women, even on a personal level. So that's really interesting, especially you know, for someone, if you already know something about John Bunyan or any of those other guys, and then you learn about this woman who met them and hear, you know, a bit about their story, it does really start to bring together a whole picture in your mind of like, oh, this is the place. These are the people. This is the time. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What do we as modern readers miss out on when we neglect the work of Puritan women? That's a good question. I think we could probably answer that on a number of different levels. So in terms of sort of like coming at it from a history perspective, similar to what I just said, if we only know of men, (laughs) we're kind of, we don't really have an accurate idea of like what life was like or who was who or what was happening at this certain period of time in this certain place because obviously men weren't the only ones that existed so from that sort of more academic side we just have a truncated view of like even who who were the men um then I think from a theological perspective something that we might miss out if we only look at Puritan men and not Puritan women um even though Puritan men do write sometimes about their personal experiences for sure. You won't find it in someone like John Owen, who basically says nothing about his life and is really just like publishing the hard theological and, you know, Christian life books. But you do see a bit of it in figures like Baxter and Bunyan, who will tell life stories and stuff like that. However, with Puritan women, what I think they sort of take a little bit step further is giving us this raw unfiltered version of what how did spirit puritan spirituality work out in real time in real life in like super specific and maybe complicated situations so it's not that we don't get that at all with the men but sometimes with the women you know even if they were sharing stuff that they were writing with their like family and and local community, which was a normal thing to do called manuscript circulation, they weren't necessarily like professional, you know, theologians or whatever, publishing their stuff for people to read. So sometimes you like, you know, with Lady Brilliana Harley's letters, maybe some other people read them, but they were definitely like 
just for her son, you know, and they were having this mother son discussion about things all the time. And so um, I think that's kind of what you get from a theological perspective. And the reason that that, you know, it's a small thing, but I think it's super important because the Puritans were that's what they were on about. They were about bringing theology, applying the Bible and theology to everyday life. So that was like a huge emphasis for them and something that they did super well. So now to get this sort of raw, unfiltered version of it, it does add to our understanding of, okay, yeah, so-and-so wrote a book about like, this is how it should be, <laughs> but that this is what happened in this really weird situation, you know, in reality. Um, and then the yeah. last thing I would say is sort of on a practical level, just for Christians, you know, the more you read other people and different people, uh, I think it can really enhance your relationship with God and also the church. Like you start to see, OK, the church is not just me and my people, my people down the road that I hang out with on Sundays and Wednesday nights or whatever. Um, this thing goes back way in time with all sorts of different people. And yeah, I mean, especially for someone who who I can identify really closely with these women, like someone who is a woman and someone who maybe is reformed, however they are reformed generally. Um, I think you can really find, you know, someone to really relate to on a close level um, and yeah. sort of have this feeling of kinship with them and just with the universal church overall. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. What's one surprising story that you found while writing your book? Um, I think the thing that shocked me the most was definitely all the stuff about uh, Lady Brilliana Harley and, you know, being attacked and writing these letters back and forth with the royalist and commander and the king, mostly because um, there was like a lot of she had to exhibit like real physical courage, like people are getting injured, she's getting sick, like all sorts of crazy stuff is happening. And I think the other thing that surprised me about that story was just how she was able to like sort of try to wiggle her way out of getting attacked. Um, she didn't really outright lie to the king, but she kind of like exaggerated. She kind of said like, oh, no, 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 we support you, even though her and her husband were very open parliamentarians who did not support the king. So that was interesting for me to see. And it just stories like that really start to make you understand like, whoa, this is a real person. Like yeah. she's this is now like a mom who's trying to protect her kids and all these other people in her house. And so she's having to do this fancy footwork <laughs> uh, in her letters to the king. So anyways, I thought that just that whole story is really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The, these were not easy lives and you do a great job of, of really bringing that out in your book. What yeah. are some of the challenges and trials these women faced in their lives and, and how did their faith sustain them? Yeah, I think, you know, they went through a lot of things that we might go through today, like losing a family member or getting sick or, you know, even being denied their human rights. Maybe so much we don't, you know, as much experience that in like Canada or other places in the West, but that happens in other places of the world today for sure. So some of the things they went through were things that we might be able to really directly relate with. But at the same time, I think, you know, not to downplay anything that we might go through, losing a loved one today is just as bad as it was, you know, at any other time or place in the world. But some of those things were uh, really exacerbated and made so much worse because they didn't have things like medicine or, you know, other support systems that we really benefit from and that can sort of take some of the edge off of some of those trials. So yeah, they, life was really hard. And, but at the same time, you know, sometimes I wonder maybe that's why they were so like strong and amazing um, and just really not wimps at all. <laughs> you could not call anyone in this book a wimp. Um, now I'm trying to remember the second part of that question. Can you remind me? Oh yes. How did their faith sustain them? Just came back. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I I mean, it's a bit hard to say because, you know, if you read the book, you can see there's all these like really specific 
specific individual things I could say about that. But I think maybe the general thing we could mention now is that they had such a strong relationship with God. Like they knew, they really knew, knew, knew deep in their soul. Like God is with me. He is working things out for my good. They had deep convictions about those types of theological ideas. And so I think, you know, even when they're going through really extreme situations of mourning and being mistreated and all sorts of stuff, uh, even if, you know, they're now going through all the normal human emotions of like being very sad or being depressed or being angry or whatever it is, they have this sort of like underlying fundamental trust in God and not even like trust in God, like, oh, he's away up there in the sky and he's controlling everything, but like they know him and they know that he knows them on a personal level and is going to give them everything they need in their life um, Mm -hmm. and always loves them no matter what. So I think maybe that's kind of the main thing that, that they sort of took with them through everything that they went through. Yeah. Yeah. What can we learn from the way that these women cared for their families and passed down their faith? Yeah. Um, One thing that really came through to me when I was sort of like surveying all their stories at the end of all my research was that, first of all, sort of connected to what I just mentioned, they have such a close relationship with God and they're, it's really like honest and real and genuine and respectful and loving. And I kind of think that gave them, you know, sort of enabled them to mirror that in their human relationships as much as possible. Obviously, those aren't like a total one to one correlation, because, you know, we've got God, he's perfect and all powerful and amazing. And then we've got people and they mess up and disappoint us and hurt us and whatever. Um, But I think maybe some of the principles of like having an honest, loving, trusting relationship kind of transferred over for them. Um, and another thing that comes to mind is they had a real genuine interest in their husbands or fathers or kids lives and they, or, you know, sister or just friend or whatever. And it wasn't so much, I think sometimes when people you know, they become influenced by these stereotypes about the Puritans, thinking that they're these harsh, mean, scary people. And, you know, they just want to like, look good on the outside or something. But that's not the vibe you get at all when you read the writings of these women. They weren't just like, oh, I have to have a good relationship with this person, because then I'm going to look like a good Christian or something. It wasn't to like, oh, these people are my props so that I can have a good public image or whatever. They were genuinely interested in their lives, genuinely love them, even when they, you know, even when someone like their kid or whatever would disagree with them or, you know, go a different path in life than they were necessarily wanting them to. So I think that really says something to us about, you know, um, we can totally achieve this balance of being faithful to God, loving him and also loving the people around us, even if, you know, they're not like falling in line or whatever. And that's actually not going to necessarily as contradictory as we might feel it is in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think these five Puritan women would think of the world today in 2023? And what advice do you think that they would offer us? Um, Oh man, that's another one I struggle with only because sometimes I have thought in the past, like, I wonder what John Calvin would think about this. (laughs) Of course, (laughs) that ends up just in frustration. (laughs) And you kind of sit there thinking, well, I have no way of answering that because so much has changed. I just have no idea. I mean, we could obviously say what John Calvin would believe about like, who God is or something like that, because I don't think that would necessarily like totally shift. Maybe it would be slightly different, but I don't think it would be like completely different. Um, So I struggle with that question a bit, but I think something that um, they would maybe be able to teach us today uh, is sort of what I just mentioned in the last question. I keep piggybacking on my previous questions here. Um, is that like 
you can live this really faithful Christian life and you can be, you know, zealous for the truth and uh, care about God more than anything else. But at the same time, you can engage with society and, you know, be involved with people around you or things around you that uh, maybe aren't zealous about all those things um, and maybe even hate those things that you love about God. Um, and I, yeah, I think that, you know, again, it, it was really striking to me when I read these women, because I was already, I wasn't thinking they were going to play into the stereotypes, but I wasn't ready for how much they just really bash the stereotypes, like yeah. totally out of the water. Like it just does not line up at all with what they were on about. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that could be something for us today, mostly because, you know, same as in lots of places and lots of times in history, sometimes Christians can feel like, oh, we're the, you know, we're getting beat up or things are not going well for us. Or I don't like what, you know, I don't like how my society is going right now. And sometimes the instinct is to pull in and to say, okay, I'm just going to not engage at all. I'm not talking to people. I'm not paying for this. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm bringing everything in house. We're going to make our own food and do our own education. And we're just going to totally separate from everyone. Um, and I think, you know, looking at the Puritans can show us that we don't actually have to do that to still be super, um, you know, convicted Christians. We can do both of those at the same time. Yeah. 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 What are some of the greatest needs for Christian women today? Yeah, I think, again, I might not be the best person for this question. I feel like Jen Wilkin, <laughs> we got to pass this one off to her. She does lots of women's ministry. I'm sure she has tons of reflections about this. But something that comes to my mind is I think, you know, sometimes we can get like really good, solid theology, um, but it doesn't connect to our life like at all and we don't know how to bring it there because maybe we don't understand that 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 theological idea enough or whatever it is and then other times we can sort of get this practical advice about our lives we're like okay i think that sounds good but honestly i'm not too sure like what's the theory behind that I, you don't know how to get back up to the theology to see oh do i agree with this or not right, yeah. and so yeah. something that i think the puritans can help us with including Puritan women, is not only giving us really specific examples of how to climb that ladder between theory and practice. Sometimes the examples, like this has happened to me many times, the example can be like super closely related to your exact question about your own life. And then you just have the answer. It's awesome. <laughs> Other times, you know, even if the, th the thing they're talking about isn't exactly what you're questioning in your own life, um, just seeing them do the up and down and doing the up and down with them. You're kind of like building your, your muscle, your strength with that so that now you can go do it on your own and you can see like, okay, this is how I get from theology to life, theology to life. So I think that's something that the Puritans could be helpful for, for women today as they receive, yeah. you know, different, all sorts of different messages in different forms. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Right. I'm sure that after reading your book, there's going to be lots of people interested in reading more about the Puritans or from the Puritans. What books would you recommend to get started? Yeah, I, I hope they want to read more of the Puritans. That would be like the greatest um, compliment to me is if you go away thinking, oh, I'm ready to just get into some primary source on my own now. That would be amazing. Um, I think, you know, when people have asked me this question in the past, I'm a little bit weary to suggest one book, because I think a great way of getting into the Puritans is starting with something like a question you're already asking or a topic that you're interested in, in terms of like Christian life stuff or theology, and seeing what exists. So sometimes you could, you might just be able to straight up Google that and be like, Puritan book on fear or whatever. If that doesn't work, Maybe you can ask like your pastor or if you have like a theological library or bookstore in your area to help you find something, you know, I've all of the libraries and bookstores that I 
interact with are always so helpful wanting to, you know, even if they don't know something off the top of their head, they're totally willing to like look into things for you and help you out. But if you don't, if nothing comes to mind when I say that to you and you have no idea where to start, I think probably Pilgrim's Progress is a good place to go. Um, partly because, you know, a lot of people love it and it's amazing, but if you end up not liking it, which is totally fine, <laughs> that doesn't offend me and, you know, you don't have to like the Puritans. Um, but if you end up not liking it, you have not wasted your time because Pilgrim's Progress is a classic of English literature, as you know, I'm sure. And, you know, some people consider it to be one of the first novels in English ever written, and it's super easy to read. So I don't think that, you know, if you end up getting to the end of it and you're like, oh, the Puritans aren't my thing, that's okay. You've now just read a classic. So take that off. Feel good about yourself. <laughs> but I think most people will love Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah. Yeah, great advice. Great advice. Jenny Lynn, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. I really enjoyed your book as well. Before we let you go, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, I don't think so. Other than, you know, I just encourage everyone to pick up the book, which I feel like I can do unabashedly because, you know, I say a little bit about myself in the book and how these women influenced my life, but it's really not about me. I really tried to focus on using their words when they were sort of like easy to read or summarizing very closely to their words, when it was a little bit trickier maybe. Um, and so I think that, you know, interacting with what they actually said can be super amazing. So please go get the book. <laughs> Brilliant. I can imagine that this might have whet your appetite to, to write more books in the future. Have you got anything else planned, Jenny? Uh, nothing specifically like I have a proposal but I do have four other books in my brain so I was kind of waiting to see how this one went and you know what my experience was it was like before getting into those but yeah sort of other ideas mostly reformed spirituality stuff that uh was would be highly influenced by uh, my work on my master's thesis and my PhD dissertation. So maybe one day, yes. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Well, how can people follow your work? How can people keep in touch with you? I am not on a ton of social media, but I do have Twitter. <laughs> so you can follow me. Uh, my name is Puritan Jenny on there. <laughs> brilliant. Well, we're going to put a link to your book. Um, so wherever you're listening or watching this interview, check the link out to the book. And also we're going to put Jenny's Twitter account in the uh, description below as well. Jenny, thanks so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you so much, David. I appreciate you having me.